This video was made possible by Tab for a Cause. Raise money for charity just by opening new tabs, which we're going to do anyway. The coronavirus is wrecking havoc on the world. Gone is the basketball season, the Summer Olympics, and unfortunately, baseball. But at least the Nationals will remain World Series champions for another year. So many things are getting canceled that people are wondering what else could possibly be canceled before this thing is over. Particularly, people are worried about the upcoming presidential election. Once considered completely unthinkable, people are now legitimately asking this question, especially since this has already impacted the political process. Already, several Democratic primaries have been postponed, even within hours of their scheduled primary date. For example, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine actually asked asked the state's Supreme Court to postpone their primary election. When the Ohio Supreme Court denied his request, he simply ordered the polls closed, effectively circumventing the court's decision. This is not about politics. This is about protecting Ohio citizens' lives. So if it's possible to postpone a primary election, can the general election be postponed as well? It's natural to wonder if President Trump already has a legally plausible plan up his sleeve to just cancel the election entirely and start a second term in office unelected. So can the president actually cancel the general election this November? The answer will surprise you. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because our democracy is at stake. Or is it? There's certainly a lot of uncertainty about the November election, and that was even before the current pandemic. Will we be standing in line to vote with masks and gloves, or will we be able to mail in our vote? Or will President Trump just take over and become the dear leader for life, as all true Americans want him to? Well, today we're going to discuss whether or not the president can actually cancel the general election, and all of the wacky legal implications that this has. Full disclosure, some of the issues and the analysis in this episode come from the podcast Opening Arguments. Opening Arguments is a great podcast run by attorney Andrew Torres and Thomas Smith. Andrew took a deep dive into this subject in response to a thought experiment by Vox journalist Ian Milhauser. I'll drop a link to the opening arguments podcast in the doobly-doo. Definitely check it out. It's really great. So the question is, can Trump cancel the general election? Well, look, I'm not going to bury the lead and make you sweat through this entire video to get to the answer. The bottom line is the president cannot legally cancel the election. It probably won't happen. Now, could he try? Well, sure, anyone can try anything, just like anyone can sue another person over anything, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be successful. But no matter what way you slice it, even with President Trump's ever expansive view of his Article II presidential powers. Then I have an Article II where I have the right to do whatever I want as president, but I don't even talk about that. Even he can't take steps that would effectively morph his presidency into a dictatorship. That's because the Constitution itself places specific parameters on presidential terms, including the length of a president's term, as well as the specific date and time as to when that term ends. But that's just the beginning of the insanity of what would happen if the election were in fact canceled. And in this context, I'm using the word canceled to mean the president actually puts troops and prevents people from actually going to the polls because he can't legally cancel the election. So we're talking about some really drastic moves here. Now, that being said, the constitution states that the president shall hold his office during the term of four years. And even more specifically, it states in the 20th amendment that his term shall end at noon on the 20th day of January. Very specific, not much wiggle room. Furthermore, the president is elected by each of the state's electors under Article 2 of the Constitution, and Congress determines the time of choosing of the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes. Remember, the president is elected not by a popular vote, but by the Electoral College. And you'll see later in this video, even if President Trump opts out to become a squatter in the White House, legally the presidency would pass to somebody else, effective on the 20th of January, 2021. Now, I can already hear you saying in the comments, great, thanks for the quick constitutional law lesson, but regardless of what the constitution says, could the president still find some shady way to use the coronavirus to his advantage to postpone or possibly cancel the November election? For instance, can the president declare martial law due to the pandemic and legally circumvent the constitution? Well, the answer to this and any other similar question is mostly no. More specifically, when it comes to the constitution, there's no known circumstance that can suspend the enforcement of the constitution. Not a pandemic, not a natural disaster, not a war, and not even a war fought between citizens of the same country, specifically the civil war. And believe me, it was tried. And that was the case in the famous constitutional law case of Ex parte Milligan, which is the 
seminal case for simply saying that the Constitution is the Constitution, and no matter the circumstances, the Constitution applies. Ex parte Milliken was born out of the events surrounding the Civil War. Like a pandemic, a civil war is an unprecedented event, and President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which was an unconstitutional event. So the first question is, in this context, what is a writ of habeas corpus? A writ of habeas corpus, as you've probably seen in movies, is a federal tool used to bring a prisoner before the court to determine if their imprisonment or detention is lawful. The drafters of the Constitution actually considered a writ of habeas corpus to be so important that they included the concept of petitioning the court for a release of a prisoner who's unlawfully detained in the first article of the actual US Constitution. Not in the Bill of Rights, not in the amendments, but in the actual constitution itself. Now, Article 1 states that the privileges of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion, of invasion, the public safety may require it. President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus at the same time that he declared martial law. Martial law is basically the law administered by military forces that is invoked by a government in an emergency when the civilian law enforcement agencies are unable to maintain public order and safety. And by the way, it's martial law spelled M-A-R-T-I-A-L, not martial spelled M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. -L. This is not some guy named Marshall, uh, it's Martial as in war, war like law. Just a pet peeve of mine that I see people <laughs> misspelling all the time on social media. Anyway, uh, notwithstanding, the facts of Ex parte Milligan involved a racist lawyer by the name of Lambden P. Milligan who was charged with conspiracy against the United States, aiding and abetting the Confederacy and inciting insurrections. Now, when Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and declared martial law, the government tried to circumvent the courts and said that Milligan could be legally tried in a military tribunal instead of through the civilian court system, where he was quickly convicted and sentenced to hang. But before Milligan could be hanged, he sued to stay the execution and the Supreme Court agreed with him saying that you can't suspend habeas corpus. The Supreme Court held that it was unconstitutional to try civilians by a military tribunal unless there were no civilian courts available, which wasn't the case. In support of the Supreme Court's holding, the court noted, and here's the important part, that citizens have certain rights by the constitution, such as the trial by jury, and that this constitutional guarantee was quote, intended for a state of war as well as a state of peace and is equally binding upon rulers and people at all times and under all circumstances. Bottom line, if Lincoln couldn't get around the constitution while Americans were literally at war with each other, then President Trump doesn't stand a chance of being able to step outside the confines of the constitution due to the coronavirus pandemic. But could President Trump try to reschedule or postpone indefinitely the election? Well, as President Trump is finding out the hard way regarding emergency powers, a lot of election power resides with the states. Article one states that the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but that Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing of senators. So election law is really up to the states with a little bit of oversight from Congress and the constitution. Federal laws have long been on the books that dictate when the president, vice president, members of Congress are elected. You can look to 3 USC 1, which states that quote, the electors of president and vice president shall be appointed in each state on the Tuesday after the first Monday in November and every fourth year succeeding every election of a president and vice president. Similar laws set the date senators and congresspeople start their term, the third day of January. These laws are incredibly specific and nothing in them provides any exception for the president to move these dates around. And since we have federal statutes in place, people should have solace that the president cannot simply reschedule the election. As Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden put, we voted in the middle of the Civil War, we voted in the middle of World War I and II, and so the idea of postponing the electoral process is just, it seems to me, out of the question. Well, this is about making sure and we're able to conduct our democracy while we're dealing with a pandemic. So now we've established the constitution and federal statutes are specific about when the elections take place and when the president's term ends. Both the constitution and federal statutes can only be changed by a subsequent act of Congress to amend them. And the president can't take any unilateral action to supersede them independently. But President Trump has repeatedly stated his belief that article two gives him absolute power. It's a thing called article two. Nobody ever mentions Article 2. It gives me all of these rights at a level that nobody has ever seen before. We don't even talk about Article 2. 
So what if in the coming months, President Trump thinks that he might lose the general election? What could President Trump do? Well, there are basically two things that President Trump could attempt to do to remain in office. He could try to convince the states to take away their citizens' right to vote for president, or he could try to use the military to physically prevent people from voting. The first scenario is much more plausible, though still very, very unlikely, because the 50 states hold considerable power in determining the rules for elections, including federal elections, then that happens to take place within their borders. The states can control the method of voting that will be used, whether or not a felon can vote, for example, and what, if any, uh, identification voters must show at the polls, though of course there are some constitutional limitations to those kind of restrictions. Namely, from the 15th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act, which deal with ensuring that citizens aren't prevented from voting due to discriminatory or arbitrary means. But other than that, the elections are mostly under the control of the states. And if forced, potentially, states could find alternative ways to hold congressional or presidential elections with each state secretively rescheduling them outside of the designated federal election day. And, or conceivably, if people are physically prevented from going to the polls no matter what, then conceivably the state legislatures could take back the power of their electors in the electoral college and uh, vote in the electoral college the way that they think that their state population would vote uh, in the general election, which of course would be incredibly ironic because it would actually be a good use for the electoral college, which under normal circumstances, there are simply no good defenses for the electoral college in this day and age to thwart the popular vote. Two thumbs down. And anyone who tries to defend the electoral college is simply wrong and or dumb, but I digress. So even if the president successfully, albeit illegally thwarts the election and electors never cast their vote uh, or their votes are never counted, there are constitutional provisions already in place that we discussed that would prevent his term from naturally extending. So if the election doesn't go forward, then President Trump doesn't just get to remain in office. To find out what would happen, we just have to go back to our conversation at the beginning of this video, which if you'll recall, is the fact that the president shall hold his office during the term of four years years, and specifically the 20th Amendment, which provides for an end date of that term, which provides that the president's term shall expire on noon on the 20th day of January. So if there is no election, then by default, the president's term ends on January 20th. One way or another, he's out of the White House. This doesn't depend on President Trump's willingness to vacate the White House. Legally, he is no longer the president. And I suspect if he stayed there, there would be some big men with green uniforms and big pointy guns that would remove him from the White House. Unless they give me an extension for the presidency. But if President Trump isn't the president, then who is? Let's play this scenario out just a little bit further because we've established that President Trump is no longer the president come January 20th, 2021. But that still begs the question, who is? Now, I'll tell you who would become president, but first I wanna tell you who should become president, and that's Jose Andres. Jose Andres is basically the patron saint of DC these days. The world famous chef created something called the World Central Kitchen to feed those in need during natural and man-made disasters. They were on the ground in Puerto Rico for Hurricane Maria, and they're out in the streets helping people during this pandemic. They've already served over 15 million meals. I just gave $500, and it would mean the world to me that if you're in a position to give, if you could give a little bit as well, the link to the website is in the description. Every little bit helps. And it would be great if we could come together and help people during this coronavirus pandemic. But the question is, who would become president in this crazy situation where there was no election? Under normal circumstances, the Constitution and the federal statutes provide an order of succession for who would take over the powers and duties of the office of president. In the event of the current president is incapacitated, dies, resigns, or is removed from office, or in this case, his term has effectively ended. And you may recall under this line of succession, which we have covered a couple times on this channel, under Article 2 of the Constitution, after the president, it goes to the vice president, and then it proceeds next to the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tempore of the Senate, and so forth under the Presidential Succession Act. Now, first things first, we can eliminate some of these options because under this hypothetical, 
there hasn't been an election. And so just as the president's term expires on January 20th, so too does the vice president's term expire. So the vice president can't pick up the mantle for the president whose term has expired on the same day. And then next, we can't necessarily give the presidency to the Speaker of the House. Because remember, members of Congress are reelected every two years. So every time there's a presidential election, all of the Congress people are also reelected. So if there is no general election, then there aren't going to be any members of Congress uh, in the House of Representatives. There might be some people in the Senate because they're elected on a six year staggered basis, but there would be no members of Congress for the most part. So this creates a bunch of really, really weird constitutional scenarios. But we know a couple things for certain. Number one, we know that the president's term expires. So that president can't remain president. Number two, vice president's term has also expired. We know that there aren't any members of Congress, presumably, at least in the first instance. So there's no speaker of the house. So that leaves a couple of really weird scenarios. Number one is that if the state legislatures or the state governors got together and just simply agreed to reappoint all of the members of Congress, then, then you have a sitting body in the House of Representatives. If that's the case, then President Trump would have to swallow hard when he finds out that that means his arch enemy, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, would now be filling his shoes as the third in the line of succession. Now, the other option would be that those in Congress whose term was set to expire would not be reappointed, which would completely abolish the House of Representatives, at least in the short term, since they're all voted on every two years. And at that point, what we have is two thirds of the senators left, since two thirds of the senators weren't up for reelection, but one third were up for reelection. So in this scenario, we have no president, no vice president, no speaker of the House, and no members of, of the House of Representatives. What that means then is we would go to the fourth person in the line of succession, which would be the president pro tempore of the Senate as the acting president because they're next in line for succession. Now, you can be forgiven if you have forgotten your high school civics. The president pro tempore of the Senate is generally the oldest serving member of the majority party in the Senate. And in this case, that would be uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, the Republican Senator who is 85 years young from the great state of Iowa, who is currently the president pro tempore of the Senate. So does that answer the question, President Chuck Grassley? Well, probably not, because remember I said that one third of the senators are actually up for reelection in this election cycle. So I don't think that the state governors are just going to sit idly by, they would probably appoint interim senators to fill the, the gaps left by the senators who, uh, who were up for reelection. And so then you have to look at how many of the vacancies would be filled by Republican governors and how many vacancies would be filled by Democratic senators. And thankfully, the math has already been done by Andrew at uh, Opening Arguments, who figured out that there are more Democratic governors who would fill vacancies than Republican uh, governors who would fill vacancies. So at the end of the day of the senators who are up for re-election uh, and are being reappointed, that probably means that there would be a Democratic majority in the Senate which means that the president pro tempore would be uh, nominated by the Democrats and the senior most Democratic senator in the Senate is none other than Vermont Senator Pat Leahy. So we can all welcome President Pat Leahy to the office. So there you go. In the wildest of twists, the most likely outcomes if President Trump were to somehow cancel the election is either President Nancy Pelosi or President Pat Leahy. I don't really know how to feel about either of those two scenarios. But after all of these crazy hypotheticals and rabbit holes that we've gone through, I'll say one more thing to ease everyone's mind. There is no plausible way in which the president could cancel or even postpone the election and remain president. We have held presidential elections in multiple world wars, in civil wars, in past pandemics, and even when the White House was burned to the ground by the British. As we've done in the past, we will elect our next president the good old fashioned way, and we will not have to deal with a President Pelosi or President Leahy.
Now, if you're waiting to see what happens to our democracy and our economy, and you want to do some good for this world, I'd recommend Tab for a Cause, which lets you raise money for charity just by opening new tabs in the browser window, which we're going to do anyway. Tab for a Cause is a Google Chrome extension that allows you to pick the charity of your choice, and then every time you open up a new tab, instead of a blank page, it displays a beautiful new customizable tab with a couple of tiny ads. And the money that you generate is then donated to your charity. You can see in real time how much money is being generated, and it's gamified so that every time you open up a new tab, you create a heart, which then you can specifically donate to the charity of your choice. Tab for a Cause has partnered with several COVID-19 specific charities as well, so you can fight the effects of the coronavirus directly. And the best part is the gorgeous new tab is really helpful too. You can customize it with graphics. I like to see pictures of the outdoors to remember what that actually looks like. You can create bookmarks, uh, create to-do lists, and write yourself notes, which I find really, really helpful when I open a new tab. All you have to do is click on the link in the description and install the Chrome extension, and then it works automatically. Tab for a Cause users like you have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity. It's the easiest possible way to give to charity. And you could even just sit there and just open up a bunch of tabs for fun. So just click on the link in the description and download the extension. And do some good by doing what you were going to do anyway. So do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and click on this playlist over here with all of my other analysis about all the legal issues surrounding COVID-19 and just click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.